Welcome to Slight Reliability. Learning SRE one day at a time. I'm Stephen Townsend. Welcome back to Slight Reliability. I'm Stephen Townsend, and this is the show where we learn SRE and observability one week at a time. Today, we're talking about reliability insights, and I have with me today Jose Velez. Is that how you pronounce the surname? Yeah. That's right. See ya. Yeah. Jose, he's an entrepreneur with a background in software engineering. He has a deep understanding of site reliability engineering, having honed his skills while building an internal observability tool at EDP, which is Portugal's largest company, where he used unsupervised machine learning for anomaly detection and time series correlation to autonomously detect and correlate performance degradation. Jose is now the founder and CEO of Rely which aims to simplify the observability and reliability journey for cloud native companies. It's a big pleasure to have you on the show, uh, Jose, and thanks for, thanks for coming on. First thing I wanted to ask is why? Why is reliability important to you? First of all, thank you very much for having me, Stephen, and for the kind introduction. And that's a very good question. So as you mentioned, as I was implementing that observability tool, that internal observability tool at TDP, the observability journey is something that's a daunting process. Like I try to learn from the materials out there how to actually do it the right way, but everything is like super theoretical. And when you get to the details, that's where the trouble comes. So basically, other than the, the whole spiel about why reliability is important nowadays, why it's, apart from that, why it's actually important for me, it's because it's like a really, really interesting challenge to solve. Like me as like a software engineer, I've got a knack for solving interesting challenges. And this one is like something that's a very interesting challenge to solve. That actually is a problem that many companies face nowadays. And it's going to become more and more important, especially because most companies are going to try to leverage reliability as a competitive advantage. So that's why actually I decided to, to start Rely. On the topic of observability, lots of organizations around the world are at least claiming that they are trying to go on an observability journey to you know, adopt observability ideas and concepts. What sort of common challenges or struggles to, do you see organizations having around the world? There are definitely many of them. Gartner actually ran a poll with to over like 10,000 companies. And to be honest, they're like pretty well aligned with what we've personally seen companies experience and they could be condensed into four key points. The first one is like lack of skills because like observability is really hard to define and hard to achieve. Companies don't know or companies or the engineers who are tasked with leading those observability journeys don't know what to monitor. They don't know how to monitor and then they struggle because as I mentioned, the devil is in the details. And even though there's a lot of theoretical content out there, when you go to the specifics of it, it's really hard to identify how you should be measuring, should you be using logs, how should you be indexing them, so on and so forth. And like these details, there are very few people with the skills to do it the right way. The second point would be sort of like the lack of resources. Naturally, because there's a short of shortage of skills, and even the experienced engineers that know how to do it right, they are busy building value for companies. Hiring site reliability engineers or DevOps or platform engineers with this expertise is also hard. They're scarce and expensive. So then it's really hard to, to find the right people to do it. The third point, and years, it depends a lot, but I, I guess it's something that happens with a lot of companies. It's the lack of leadership involvement. Not because the leaders don't want to, in, to be involved, but because they're like multiple layers towards observability. And what the engineers know, so like the services that they're responsible for, the codes that they're shipping, many times, unfortunately, is not mapped to the language that the business people know. Even the product, it's not even mapped to the end product that the company is delivering. And this problem is somewhat tied with the, the team silos that actually happens a lot. And it's naturally sort of like something that you that you should avoid. It's an anti-pattern anti in, in a sense where each different team only knows the context of the component that they're developing, sometimes even the service, if they're doing things right, let's call it that. And then the biggest problem is that they 
don't know how to map to the business logic. And the very important thing is that they're using different practices, different methodologies and different tools. And then it's really hard to correlate the data from the different tools. And sometimes you're like comparing apples with oranges. So for example, if a team is using P95 for response time and another one is using P99, then you're comparing two different things and it's really hard to prioritize for example, the reliability improvements that you need to do. What you were saying about observability not necessarily aligning with actual business objectives, uh, I think is really important. And my understanding is, I'm not, I'm not very experienced in this space, my understanding is that is one of the benefits that SLOs can provide. Is that is that your understanding? And, and what else? why else are SLOs important or valuable to organizations? Yeah, that's a very good point, Stephen. So first of all, service level objectives provides a common language to define system expectations that is understandable by everyone, be it engineers, engineering leaders, executives, the product managers, even like customer success and sales and customer support to understand how to communicate with the customers in case there's an issue. So it's very important to have this common language to make sure that you improve the communication and the alignment throughout the different areas of the company and the different personas that care about reliability that should be everyone at the company. Uh, and naturally, they provide clear and measurable targets for system performance. This allows organizations to understand very well where they're not meeting customer expectations. And this is sort of like the baseline. But something that's actually very important is that the SLOs allow you to quantify reliability in a standardized way across the company. And then, right, this solves actually a lot of the observability challenges that I was just mentioning. And it unlocks a lot of benefits for the companies. For example, it allows you to report around reliability throughout the, the company in a way that everyone can understand and with the context that they need. So basically with this standardized product health view, you can visualize at the highest layer. So for example, at the business or the user journey layer, how your customers are experiencing your product. If there's an issue, you can then drill down into the edge services, for example, that are supporting those user journeys. It allows you to articulate naturally around the reliability ownership of each of these different entities. And then naturally it allows you to drill down as far as you need to go to then troubleshoot the issue in case there's an incident. So it also allows you to improve incident management. And if you alert with these SLOs, it allows you to tackle alert fatigue because you, you actually are able to quantify the impact of the incidents. So you only alert when there's actually an issue that needs to be solved only in case it's actually actionable. So all of this together co combine and naturally with the possibilities of automation that is in locks because you've got sort of like a trigger that's 99.9% .9 accurate. So you can accurately rely on that trigger to do a lot of different automation. So release rollbacks, self-healing, auto-scaling, things that usually are done with the monitoring, but lack the context of the, the actual impact. So this makes it be much more reliable. Let's call it that. I understand the theory. I guess in my own experience, I do find it hard to go from, well, let's say there's a fairly large organization and, and the CEO and the leadership team has said, we want you know, our, our biggest priorities for the next year is we, wanna, we want 250,000 new customers and we want you know, that kind of level of thing. And then how do you go from that kind of, this is your goal as an organization to, SLOs you know, about reliability. Like there seems like there's a chasm there, which I don't understand necessarily how to go from there to there. I'm not going to lie. That's not an easy journey. And there's not a one, one size fits all answer. So to, to lay it out there, even if I, if I answer that, it's with the caveat that it needs to be tailored to your specific organization layout and to your specific needs and to your industry and so on and so forth. So like there's, just to say that don't take my answer with a grain of salt because it needs to be tailored. And there are many approaches to this. One of the approaches that we've seen work, and that's the one that I'm going to, to briefly explain, can work for most companies, but only up until a certain level. You need to, to make some adjustments to it. Uh, 
So, so basically what we actually recommend companies to do is to start out from the outside in. What I mean by this is that first you need to understand what matters the most for your business. So outside in or top down. So what I mean by this is you need to map out your product catalog. So identify what are the critical user journeys your users go to and what are the edge services that need to perform well for the users to have a good experience. In other words, what are the edge services that these user journeys depend on? Then align on the reliability ownership of each of these. Who owns the reliability of this user journey or the experience of users in this user journey? Who owns this edge service? And naturally, you can then go in depth uh, until the actual code level for the most critical user journeys. One important thing is not to try to do everything at once. You need to chart a roadmap to take iterative increments towards this. Ideally starting with the most important user journeys for the business and then going in depth as needed. This allows you to do something that's very important. That's to articulate what you need to measure. And this is like a, a very key point because a key problem, as I mentioned around observability is that Usually companies just go in, especially with nowadays uh, observability and monitoring providers, they allow you to generate telemetry automatically. The problem with this is that this is very good for the observability players because they charge with the amount of data that you collect, but it's bad for you because the more data doesn't mean the more insights. That's what you're looking for. It actually it's the, the other way around. The more the data you've got, the harder it is to extract insights and to actually get visibility into the things that matter to the users and to the business. So a targeted approach in our experience is the way to go. Naturally leveraging the automated telemetry for the specific things that you should be monitoring. And it could be logs, it could be metrics, it could be distributed tracing, even though like there's only a small amount of companies, less than 1%, at least in our experience that we've seen adopt distributed tracing. And that's for a good reason, because it's hard. So you need to identify what you should be measuring and how, and clearly articulating sort of like the product catalog is the first step. And then as you chart out this roadmap and have the reliability ownership clearly mapped out, you then need to articulate the best practices and the definitions of the measurements that you're going to use and of the goals. This allows all of the different teams to follow the same practices so that you can then compare and report the same thing. Otherwise, it's going to be bad data because you're going to be reporting on one thing, but people, the different engineering teams are using different standards. And after you've had sort of like this roadmap and this plan mapped out, then you need to establish a clear communication plan to make sure that everyone is aligned on why you are doing that. That's very important so that people feel empowered and they can also contribute more actively and how you're going to do it. And then naturally the, the next step would be to start with the most relevant touch points that matter the most to the business, usually with the, the critical user journeys. And then the specifics of it are really case dependent, but I guess this gives an overall view of the topic. I think that's actually really practical advice and a good starting point. We don't talk about how to actually make your silos work enough, and I like that a lot. Oh, interesting you were saying that sort of less than 1% of the sort of customers that you're talking to are actually doing distributed tracing, uh, whereas that is you know, open, the open telemetry project, that is the thing which has been mostly focused on so far. Uh, and yet most organizations are still relying on logs and metrics. And that's interesting. Uh, so I guess the expectation is within that project that open to, uh, the distributed tracing will be adopted much more widely in the future. It is, but to be honest, it's there's still like a lack of knowledge of how to do it right. It's still very hard. And combine the, the lack of skills and the lack of knowledge and the lack of resources, I think that's the biggest reason why it hasn't been adopted yet. But I'm seeing it slowly and slowly being more and more adopted. And naturally, it should only be adopted for the specific use cases because that's not the answer for everything. For, for example, in a, in a case where you've got an application that has a, a lot of reliance on third-party providers, distributed tracing is not the way because you cannot trace the, the third-party providers. So like, there's not one-size-fits-all 
for all of the different challenges. So it's very important that you you need to have the SRE function, not necessarily the SREs themselves. Ideally, if you can afford and if you can find good SRE talent to set out the best practices for the organization to adopt the better or look for external help in the cases that make sense for you. Speaking of SREs, a lot of organizations have this this team called the SRE team, and it sort of sits to a side somewhere like a DevOps team. Uh, to me, that sounds like a, a potential anti-pattern. Uh, do you think that there's a, a particular team topology that, that works for SRE, and, and does that work, having an SRE team? I wouldn't necessarily lay it out there as an SRE team is an anti-pattern. What I would definitely say that's an anti-pattern is if you've got an SRE team in a silo, where you expect the reliability ownership to be assigned to them. That I would be that I would, I would consider an anti-pattern, similar to the DevOps teams back in the days or some, in some companies still today, where developers ship the code and then it's off to the DevOps to, to handle in production. Like those types of silos are an anti-pattern. And for all intents and purposes, by the way, the way I see SRE is as a function. So the, the important role that the SREs have to play is to champion the principles of reliability engineering and educate their teams and the companies on the best practices and help them do the cultural shift that needs to to take place and naturally drive the process changes to drive an improvement in reliability across the company. And for them to do that, there are multiple ways to achieve this goal. One way that we've seen work, not to say that it's the best, because once again, it's very case specific, is to have one central team of SREs. So this to say that the SRE team on itself is not an anti-pattern, but similar to the the Spotify organizational chart, where this team, even although being a central team, they can be considered a guild, for example, they set the rules for all of the other teams to take ownership of the services that they ship. So basically, they make sure that everyone is following the same practices and they hold them accountable to make sure that the organization has observability compliance in in multiple ways. And naturally, they serve as the coaches. So in the cases that they're going to face practical examples where it's very hard to understand how to instrument a service, what should we be measuring for this specific user journey, they, they sort of help it out there. And then they can either act as a task force going to different teams as needed, according to the priorities that, for example, the SLO set, or they can be embedded into like cross-functional teams. So for example, each of the different SREs belongs to a certain team, but then they gather together within the guild to make sure that they don't create silos of information. And both of these I've seen work and basically depends on how the organization is structured. Talking about service ownership, I've seen plenty of situations where it's it's not clear who owns a service, especially like in an ideal world, I think we would have teams structured. We have value stream teams who kind of own a service end to end. But in most organizations, from my experience, that's not the case. You'll have a service which is actually provided by essentially maybe 10 different engineering teams, you know, it's a bit extreme, maybe six different teams. Uh, and so who who owns the service? That, that's a very good question. Not only the service, but also like the reliability of the user journeys, because that's where it starts. And I do agree that especially in larger companies, there's that anti-pattern of engineering teams being, I mean, not necessarily anti-pattern, you just if not done right, it becomes an anti-pattern of the engineering teams owning just the service components that they ship, especially because with microservice architectures, it allows you to basically develop specific components where you don't need to have the context of the rest. However, someone needs to have that context. So even if the teams or the, the engineers are just focused on specific microservices, for example, that need to have their own SLOs per se, to make sure that, for example, that specific microservice is having the necessary level of reliability to make sure that the end service meets the the end level of reliability. So to answer your question of like who owns the service, technically it should be something top down, or at least not, not should be, but one approach that we've seen to work very well is to do top down. So to have, for example, the VP level or the director level people at the company own the most the edge services 
and the user journey. So for example, the VP of product or the different product managers responsible for each feature to own the SLOs or the level of reliability of each of the different user journeys. The same way that they define the acceptance criteria pre-production, they should also own that acceptance criteria in production. And for the, the different services, basically, you should have a clear picture, even if not the of the service as a whole in the cases where you can't, because ideally you should have, as you mentioned, value stream teams that own the end-to-end -end service. But in the cases where it's not structured like that, you should have at least have ownership of the teams of the service operations or the functionalities that the service is responsible for. And then the service should be owned by the director or the head of engineering of that specific department, where then that person is responsible for holding all of the functionalities that the service is responsible for accountable to their SLOs. In other words, they need to make sure that each of the different teams or the engineers who are responsible for those service operations that as a whole make up the service are doing their due part. Let's say that. I have seen plenty of situations where a service is owned by maybe three different executives, um, you know, and that's it's very confusing. So I, I think it's, it's easy to underestimate how powerful it is just to change the structure of the organization a little bit to support, you know, ownership of services and, and, and when, how they can flow on, I think. True. So I'm glad that you mentioned that. <laughs> One, an another approach that we've seen work very well, but for you, for this, you need to have things very well structured is to have the people who own the repos, for example, of the service also own the reliability of the service. This, of course, if you structure this correctly, this serves a very powerful structure for the organization and it makes it clear for everyone not only of who owns the reliability of the services but it also forces you to structure the codes in a way that makes it much easier to then troubleshoot for example and to improve is that is, is that the same or different to the whole you you build it you run it it's the same thing it's just like a pragmatic approach to how you can build it and run it specifically in microservices architecture yeah. in my experience trying to define SLOs uh, for services owned by many different teams, sometimes reporting to different executives, it's very hard in that context to define SLOs uh, because you know you could define the, the SLO for the whole service from the customer perspective, but then you've got these teams downstream saying, well, what's, you know, what's my level of reliability? What level of reliability do we need to provide to, for the whole end-to-end -end thing to make sense? Are there particular like team structures or that support SLOs is a guess that that's what I'm asking. To be honest, SLOs can be effective regardless of the structure of the teams. Naturally, certain team structures, as you mentioned, can make it easier for the organizations to establish and meet the SLOs. To be honest, you've already mentioned the one that we've seen to, to be the most effective one where you've got those value stream teams where those teams are responsible for the services end to end and it's the code that they ship. This gives them the full context of basically the entire stack of the code and supposedly, if you do it right, of the user journeys that those services are mapping to or that those services support. And it, it also allows you to define certain levels of reliability for the services that are needed in order for the user journeys to have the necessary level of experience to meet user expectations. And this not only allows you to clearly articulate what are the goals, the, the reliability goals that your services should strive towards, but it also allows you to very easily quantify the impact that, a, for example, service degradation has on the end user experience. And this is definitely like the best way. On the other hand, silo teams, as we just spoke about where they are responsible for individual components of a service naturally this makes it very difficult to establish end-to-end -end slos however even in these cases slos provide an easier way for for example the developers that we just mentioned or the engineers that are just focused on a specific context without the entire uh, a specific service without the context of the rest of the organization if you map out the SLOs right, it, it's, it can provide sort of like a hierarchical tree for the higher level layers that that 
microservice is supporting. And it allows you to trickle down from the user journey to the edge service to the specific microservice, for example, that that engineer is responsible for. And it provides a big picture of how that microservice fits in the overall architecture. Companies just lose track of their service catalog. And in most cases, they don't even have a product catalog. So this makes it extremely hard. But if you map this correctly, it makes it extremely easier to then onboard new people, to get the big picture and solve the incidents faster, to prioritize the reliability improvements because you understand how that microservice is impacting a user journey. Even if it's by extrapolating how this microservice is impacting a service and how that service is impacting the user journey. But you can actually see through the map and navigate and identify what are the improvements that matter the most for the business and for the users. And what are the improvements that don't matter, where you shouldn't be wasting time. And that can actually make companies move much faster. So we've been talking a little bit about SLOs. I think they're pretty hard to do well. Uh, do you think, in your opinion, can you do SRE without SLOs? <laughs> That's a hard question to answer. So like, theoretically, by the book that Google wrote, and uh, to be honest, um, one, one of our investors uh, is uh, a director of engineering at Google. So we've been speaking a lot with him about what worked, what didn't work, what worked at Google that might not work at other companies. And a conclusion that we've definitely come up with is that the SLOs are sort of like a tool that should be solved, used to solve a problem. So even if you use SLOs, you need to clearly articulate what is the end goal, what is the big problem that you're trying to solve. Like when you're a hammer, everything looks like an L. So it should not be a tool used to solve every single problem. With that said, SRE and SLOs are closely related, but it is possible to do SRE without SLOs. However, technically, SLOs are like the backbone of many of the practices that SRE advocates for. So like they're the, the, the base for observability because they provide a standardized way for you to quantify the reliability or to basically, in other words, to identify what you should be measuring and how. And they're the backbone for alerting. They're critical for incident management because they allow you to quantify the impacts and to categorize the severity of the different incidents and to solve the incidents faster because you can identify what are the services or the components that are impacting the end user experience. And they provide you a budget and to make sure that that you are not striving towards 100% availability or reliability, which is not feasible. And even if it was, which it's not, it would be too expensive and inefficient. So in other words, you can do SRE without SLOs, but they're at the very backbone of everything that you do. So if you don't use them, you're very likely not going to be doing it the right way. So you, you work in the space of, sort of AI, machine learning, I've generally been rather cynical about that whole thing for, for most of my career. I, I was just curious to get your view around sort of automated resolution of issues, self-healing. Does it, does it really work? <laughs> and, and I'm guessing the answer is in some context or in the right context. So what, and what kind of situations is it most valuable and most effective? So there are two different points. There's like, the self-healing and the AI applied to IT operations. I don't think the two are the same because, for example, I wouldn't use AI for self-healing. The main reason is that there's not enough structured data yet. Eventually, we might reach a level of maturity at most companies where they've got enough structured data, especially if they start building upon SLOs, which can definitely help that, where you can train the machine learning models to be accurate enough for you to be able to rely on them. With my own experience, because as you mentioned earlier, I've actually built uh, some unsupervised and some semi-supervised machine learning models for anomaly detection and time series cross-correlation. It doesn't work with enough accuracy for you to accurately be able to rely on them. So if you use AI, it's just, at least the, the biggest use cases, it's just when cover and in some cases correlate and group alerts, events, and metrics that matter the most and are that are anomalous, but you can never use them, or at least not with the current level of maturity that 
uh, AI Ops is at to rely on for incident management, for alerting, and even worse, for self-healing. However, there is a possibility to, to do self-healing the right way, not for everything. And once again, this needs to be case specific, but if you you're absolutely certain that you can quantify the impact of a certain service, for example, you can actually use that indicator. In this case, let's use SLOs because let's be pragmatic. That's what we're talking about. You can use the SLOs as a trigger to, for example, do release rollbacks because you can be absolutely sure that if the SLOs trigger an alert, there's an impact. If that impact is associated, for example, with an event that's a new release, you cannot be absolutely sure that it was a release that triggered that impact, but there's such a high chance that if you just do the release rollback, you solve the issue, or not solve the issue, you mitigate the issue. That's the most important thing in incident mass management. I guess you, you've been speaking with Sebastian Witz a lot of times, so he's the one that actually puts this in my head. But um, back back to what I was saying, this allows you, for example, to quickly mitigate the incident without having any human involvement. There are other cases, for example, I've recently read a few white papers, white papers, no, actually um, scientific papers, where they're trying to apply SLOs to autoscale Kubernetes, not just based on the monitoring. So basically the monitoring is based on like the CPU, the saturation of the different clusters, but then you don't have another important data point. That's what's the impact of the key service that this Kubernetes cluster is supposed to provide. And if you've got the two pieces of the puzzle, you can be much more accurate around, for example, if it starts having a performance degradation in the latency, you can then auto scale the cluster to make sure that that performance degradation is mitigated. And that makes it much more accurate to, to auto scale, for example, and to solve a lot of different possible issues. I'm not going to get into the de detail of the other things because then it's case specific, but then you can do a lot of automation on top of SLOs. And that's another key benefit that they provide because you can be up, if you set them upright, this is an important thing. If you set them upright, you can 100% rely on them to then do a lot of automation. So hang on, I just want to clarify. So are you saying, hey, I like, hey, I'm I'm a Kubernetes cluster, and not only do I know what my own utilization is and how saturated my resource usage is, I also know um, the sort of how important the service are the services are that I'm running in a way, so I can I can use that to help make decisions about whether I need to do anything about the fact that I'm oversaturated or not. That's pretty cool. It's it's still as I mentioned, I, I read this in a white paper. I've never actually seen it implemented, but I think at least the way that the trend is going, it's definitely something that's going to start being used very soon. The most common use cases for automation right now, as I mentioned, that we're advocating for and that we're helping companies do is definitely like release rollbacks and incident management policies according to the impact of the incident. And then naturally, according to the reliability ownership of the specific SLO that is triggered, you can then do, for example, adaptive paging where you page exactly who matters and you can sort of create an error budget policy with the step or sort of like the run book that you should use in case that error budget policy is triggered. And this allows you to set up really strong processes for incident management at the companies. One more thing about SLOs. Uh, should they be applied to other areas of a company other than technology services? So technically, in a sense, they already sort of applied to certain areas. So for example, service, uh, sorry, customer service, manufacturing, logistics. You, you already have like the SLAs, even though they don't call it SLOs, but for example, let's use Uber's example. Say that, or they can commit to their customers, even if it's internally, that 99% of the, the rides are uh, delivered to you within, for example, 10 minutes. And this allows you to set sort of like the service expectations, but in this case, not at the engineering level, at, for example, the customer service level, that your users expect to have a good experience. Naturally, the degradation in this SLO very likely might not be due to an engineering issue, but it might be. So technically, I, to be honest, this, I, I've never seen this implemented with the actual terminology of SLOs, but technically you could actually create SLOs at the business level. So for customer support, customer success, customer service, so on and so forth. 
and it would allow you to to do even a trickle down one step above so instead of seeing the user journeys that are impacted so seeing how many users are able to to have an interaction in less than 100 milliseconds that supposedly is the threshold where it doesn't feel seamless anymore on top of that you could actually have for example product level SLOs you could have like the amount of users who complete this user journey in less than five minutes very likely the the issue might not be because of the latency it might be one reason but then you could actually see if they're not meeting this SLO because it doesn't have a good user experience and you need to actually revamp the UI or the UX to make it better to make sure that you meet that goal that product defined as being the acceptable level of experience for that user journey. But if, for example, the issue would be the latency, you could see, okay, there's an impact on the user experience. It's because of this latency SLO at the user journey level, and it's the service that the queries to this database are taking too long. And you could have a real full picture of visibility with all of the dependencies. And in some cases, you need to do some manual correlations because like, you cannot absolutely be certain that if there's an issue on one, it's because of the other. But at least you've got the two pieces of the puzzle and a human can put that together. Like, is it because of this or not? And then you've got all of the information you need to make that decision. Uh, thank you so much, Jose, for coming on the show and, and, and chatting to us about reliability and SLOs and insights and AI and all the good stuff we talked about. Uh, that is all for another episode of Slow Reliability. Uh, I will see you all next week and uh, hopefully your on-call, if you are on-call, goes smoothly. See you then. Thank you very much, Stephen.